The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Too many communities in Ontario find they cannot seem to solve the homeless crisis. Tonight, London, Ontario's Mayor Josh Morgan explains why there's great optimism about his city's approach. Then, J.N. Jagannathan profiles the dangers but essential work of shipbreaking to recycle Lakers. And from Ontario's 2023 budget to lingering concerns about building in the Greenbelt, we've got the Agendas Week in Review. It's Friday, March 24th, and that's all ahead on the Agenda. In his first State of the City address, London Mayor Josh Morgan announced a massive anonymous donation of $25 million to help fight homelessness. It's enabled a new approach to confronting an urgent problem, one where he said, quote, delays are not measured in days, they're ultimately measured in deaths. Josh Morgan was elected just this past October after two terms as a city councillor and joins us now on how his city hopes to make real progress for unhoused people in the community. Welcome, Your Worship. Welcome back, I should say. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be back. Before you were a, here? Bit of a time period <laughs> between visits, but... Uh, when were you here last? It was like 2015. Mm -hmm. I was here talking about ranked ballots because our city was one of the first... Um, to implement ranked ballots across Canada. Mm -hmm. Now that has since been taken away, but I uh, had a great conversation about that at the time. Okay, yes. and nice now you're back. back as mayor. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and your, uh, your city is doing something remarkable. Um, I just want to break down what it is that's happening in London right now. Um, your city of London's plan to combat homelessness, it's titled London's Health and Homelessness Whole of Community System Response. The plan centers around building 24-7 integrated shelter hubs, starting with five and eventually 12 to 15 in total. Each hub can service between 25 to 30 people. The goal is for the hubs to be low barrier. Uh, intake and outreach will involve a coordinated multi-agency effort. The hubs will provide access to private and congregate spaces, basic needs such as food, showers and laundry facilities, acute and primary care, as well as housing and income supports. In addition, London wants to construct 100 high support housing units in the short term with 600 units erected over the next three years. Some people may say this is very ambitious. How would you describe it? Uh, I would say it's needed. Um, so it may be ambitious, but it's absolutely what, what our city needs. And if you think about how we built this system, it was hundreds of individuals who ranged from those in our hospital system, those on the frontline services, those in general health care, those uh, in our development and business community, as well as our city staff, all coming together through a series of summits representing over 70 organizations saying this is how we need to transform our system. So although it is ambitious, uh, it is absolutely positively needed and that comes from the voices of those who know uh, know this space the best. Um, walk us through what this system response might look like in real life. How does an unhoused person in London go from being on the streets to having their needs met? Yeah, so the system response is really about meeting people where they are. So having a low barrier hub allows people to come into a space, get some basic services they might need. It might just be laundry or a shower or food or shelter from the warmth. And then they can leave that if they need to. But contained within that mm -hmm. hub, is actually a range of services that when they choose to take it to the next step, to tackle an addiction or deal with a mental health issue or look for more permanent housing and stable housing, those services are integrated in the hub and we can roll people into the needed services and ultimately into housing with the proper supports. So whereas we had all of these services available in our city before, what we've really designed is a system and pathways through that system mm -hmm. from being on the streets into the type of housing that will support that individual to be successful in their housing journey. So right now, um, people can access those services uh, separately, not together. Yeah, I wouldn't call it integrated at all. And, and what we have is a lack of coordination between the services. So the hubs provide 
the ability for those services to go. The other thing we don't have is, is a one point of contact. So what we're designing with the system is there will be one point of contact, one point of referral that everybody will be using everybody will uh, will know, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's a business who sees someone who needs help or an agency who has someone come in their door and doesn't know where to send them. The hub system will be a fully integrated system that is cross-coordinated through all the agencies mm -hmm. so that there's, there's no wrong door to show up to first. Right, so the people that need the care know exactly where to go. Yeah, and we've never had that before in our city. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of cross-collaboration. In some cases, we've had agencies working uh, in complete silos, uh, unaware of what others are doing. But we have every everybody speaking with one voice at this time and everybody on the same page for where we need to go next, which means there are some organizations that will have to transform how they do things over time. And everybody is committed to the cause, to meeting the challenge, to helping the most vulnerable in our city. And that means they're willing to do things differently, which I think is both transformative as well as very brave. For you to say, I'm willing to change my organization mm -hmm. to meet the need, I think is, is an incredible thing. Um, and at the heart of this, obviously, is lack of housing. We yeah. all know that housing has become extremely unaffordable for everybody right across the board. Mm -hmm. um, the province and the country itself hasn't really been um, building social housing. Your aim is to build 600 high support housing units, uh, a bold goal. Mm. Uh, what makes your plan feasible? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that make our plan feasible. One is we're speaking with one voice now and we know how we want to integrate this. And I would say there's a couple of things we have going in our favor. First is, as you mentioned off the top, the very generous private contributions from an anonymous donor to start us off at 25 million and another 5 million of matching, which means you know we essentially have the capacity here to start from the private sector at $35 million. We then have uh, existing programs at the federal level on the housing side, whether that's a Rapid Housing Initiative or the new Housing Accelerator Fund uh, or the various investments that our council has made over the years. And in our last multi-year budget, we invested tens of millions of dollars into the housing space. So we can bring that focus and that money under this banner. And I would also be remiss if I didn't credit um, the provincial government in their budget yesterday in putting money into mental health and addictions, putting money into uh, homelessness prevention, uh, all of which will support the type of system that we want to build. So what we have is, I think, a lot of things going in our favor, which, ma which makes the ambition of the system a little more realistic when you look at um, that it is truly a whole of community and, and ideally whole of government with all governments pulling in the same direction approach. Uh, you mentioned the budget. I will come back to that sure. in a few moments. Um, but, you know, everything, it sounds great. Uh, first yeah. of all, do you know who the anonymous donor is? I do. I've, I met with them many okay. times, sat and, in their living room and talked about it. But I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, Okay, yeah. I was I was gonna ask. Yeah. Well, you, when you pay, when you give twenty five million dollars, you get uh, you get some. I mean, it's so incredibly yeah. generous, and I it know. sounds fantastic. Yeah. The idea yeah. sounds great. Um, let me tell you what's what's so amazing about that donor. Mm. They gave the money, not knowing the final version of what the system would look like. Like they they see the problem as so significant and 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 such a focus for our community to have to have to land on mm -hmm. that they gave this money without exactly knowing how our hub system would, would be finalized and developed. They, they know now, mm -hmm. they're very happy with it, but they had that huge amount of trust to give a, a significant portion of their personal wealth mm -hmm. into a cause. And I, I think they did that because they believed in the people at the table. And, and I wanna say something for a moment about those people at the table. Um, not just healthcare workers, not just businesses, not just the city, but those frontline agencies, people who have been in this space for decades, almost their whole lives, some of them, who have seen people that they've served suffer and die. Um, the donors know that these people in this space um, know what's know where we have to go, and they and, and they believe in them so much that they gave this money without really knowing where it landed. Because this is what the system was designed by. It was that collaboration of of all of those partners together. Well, you mentioned frontline workers and the forgotten. 519, mm -hmm. hashtag the forgotten 519, uh, is a group of frontline workers. They staged a hunger strike last year to bring attention to London's homeless community. Could London City Council have pushed this forward without their efforts and the advocacy of other organizations? So I don't think so. I think that the work that they did to come together and to put pressure, not just on us, but, but 
the bringing together of the different agencies for the first time to start to talk. Uh, I think in this, the city was a bit of, of the bad guy. And sometimes you need uh, a bad guy to bring people together, to have them sit beside each other, to talk about how their agencies can work together. So when and, you say the city was a bit of a bad guy, yeah. do you mean that uh, we they should the, have done something better? We were the focus of, of, of the protests, mm. right? And, and what they were calling for is the system is broken, it needs to be transformed, and the city needs to provide some leadership in that. And so what we did uh, was a couple of things coming out of that. One, we transformed our city-led winter response into a community-led winter response. This was the temporary response to deal with helping people through the winter and the cold. Um, that actually caused us to start to work in a different way with agencies and agencies with each other that rolled into these health and homelessness summits where we brought hundreds of people together and dozens and dozens of agencies to get on the same page. So I think you know everything happens for a reason and where we've landed now today is people who are outside of City Hall protesting are sitting at the table with us as part of the solution and helping us design this whole of community system. Um, you know, it's one thing for um, group uh, community members like those frontline workers to go on a hunger strike to help their unhoused neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's the number is over 200 people in yeah. London. Unhoused people have died since 2020 mm -hmm. uh, from sleeping on the streets. And um, ideally, you would want everyone to say this is a great idea, but these the units that you're building have to go to a neighborhood. Um, and we've all heard about the NIMBYs, uh, the not in my neighborhood. So how will you navigate that sentiment from community members? Yeah, so this is always a challenge the cities face, whether it's uh, a high density or, or infill development, or whether it's it placing critical services in neighborhoods. And I think what we have now is a very thoughtful approach. Uh, we have a governance structure that we're developing. We are going to do engagement with communities and ultimately, the hub-based system is what will make things better. It's what will give people a place to go, take them off of the streets, stop sleeping in doorways, um, uh, find the shelter, security, and support that they need at the time that they need it. And so, although you know the placement of the hubs might have some friction around them, ultimately the hubs are what is going to lead to the overall situation in our downtown, in our core, in our city as a whole, lead it to be better. And, and they will need to be spread out. We will need hubs in multiple locations. And those hubs will also have to be designed as we, as we build them out with specific purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I could envision us needing a hub uh, specifically for women or those who identify as women. I could see us absolutely needing an Indigenous-led uh, response uh, that is hub-based and, and, and we would design that. Uh, we wouldn't design it, actually. We're going to allow our, our local Indigenous communities to work alongside us and design their solution to the system. But we also need you know, things for people with significant mental health challenges, uh, things for people who are young moms with, with uh, young kids, and, and our YOU, Youth Opportunities Unlimited, is doing some amazing work in that space in our city. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is, yes, it could be, you know, some friction as we place the hubs, but we're going to have known, responsible, uh, really uh, smart agency partners mm -hmm. running and working in those hubs that I think people will hopefully embrace in their communities. Um, your city also um, had so many great ideas coming from London. You had the HOME bus that would mm -hmm. go to where it was needed and people mm -hmm. could access um, healthcare through the uh, th through the home bus. Yeah. Um, but how would this plan reform existing procedures at places like hospitals? Because yeah. s hospitals might be the places that unhoused people go to, but they might not always be where they feel the safest. Yeah, the, well, there's two places that people land when, uh, when no one knows who to call, and that's the police and the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And I am happy to say that both of those agencies were at the table, including the CEOs of both of our hospital systems, in the design of where we needed to get to. But there will be other things that happen within the healthcare system that will be able to support the work we're doing. When we look at the work that our EMS service is doing, and, and it's run by the County of Middlesex, and we have a great partnership with them, they're talking to the Provincial Health Ministry about, can we have more community paramedicine? Can we have more alternate drop-offs rather than just taking everybody who gets a call to the emergency room? Which, when we have a built-out hub system, will provide some of those alternate locations so that people who don't need to land in the emergency room and in the hospital system don't have to land there. People People who uh, would traditionally call the police for an emergency response, uh, that may be referred into uh, mental health workers or addiction support workers who could bring them and get them to a hub that has that integrated services there. So uh, I think that there are strains on multiple parts of our system right now, mm -hmm. but there's a response, mm -hmm. this whole of community response we're working towards has those players who have the strains on their system 
at the table, and they understand that at what we're building will benefit uh, will benefit their organizations in taking some of that pressure off both their services and their frontline workers. Well, the will seems there to do um, to make this happen, but mm -hmm. you are going to need money. Yes. How are you going to staff these hubs? Yeah. So, like I said at the start, we've got a number of pots that we can draw on, and we have an amazing you know public uh, donation campaign uh, already going on that, that was kicked off by that very generous donor with the twenty five million. Um, we also have a number of other sources that, like I said, we have at the city. So when you think about both the hub-based system as well as the housing that goes with it, mm -hmm. uh, I would give the federal government credit for the tremendous amount of investments that they've made in, in housing through the Rapid Housing Initiative, now the Housing Accelerator Fund, and other avenues that we can draw from. And, and with the right flexibility in those programs, we can shift into a model to support the hub-based system. Mm -hmm. But as I said, we also made tremendous investments in our last multi-year budget, a decade-long investment into housing that we can now refocus and bring under what is a much more integrated model. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of tools at the disposal for us to get started. Where we will need to continue to have conversations with the province, and I know we'll talk about their provincial budget, mm -hmm. is the initial injection is great, but long-term healthcare dollars to support the wraparound service supports is critical to this being successful. This is a healthcare issue, right? Why is this a healthcare issue? Because I think sometimes yeah. people might not be able to connect the dots of how the unhoused um, crisis is a health issue. Yes, uh, so they're, they're, they're connected. You can't have stable, secure housing if you have an addiction, if you have mental health challenges. Healthcare and healthcare resources allow for that stability in people's lives to be successful with their healthcare journey. And when you talk about the types of wraparound supports that you need mm -hmm. to either break addiction or to have mental health supports. When you look at the work that organizations like Indowell and others are doing to provide those, those are healthcare-based services in a housed environment to help people be successful. Um, just building housing and throwing someone into it is in some cases setting people up for failure if they don't have the proper supports to be successful. When you've been living on the street uh, for a period of time, mm -hmm. Um, there is a transition that has to happen sometimes and supports that you need to transition into stable long-term housing and the responsibilities that go with that. So that, that piece in between mm -hmm. is absolutely critical and, and that is healthcare, healthcare dollars. But this isn't just a feel-good initiative by the City of London. How does the City benefit by doing this? Well, the City benefits in multiple ways. First and foremost, we're, we're acting in response to a need. As we said, you know, our delay in this is not measured by days, it's measured by deaths uh, of citizens on our street, whether that's by cold, whether that's by addiction, or whether that's by anything else that could happen to them. So first and foremost, it benefits the city because it is our job to provide safety and security and opportunity for the citizens we represent. Second, there are a huge number of services that are overwhelmed that we fund as a city. That's the police service, uh, we fund the land ambulance service in partnership with the county, uh, and the hospital service, which is funded provincially, um, certainly has an impact on the residents of London. Mm -hmm. They are all very strained um, through this crisis. And, and so a reimagined, integrated whole of community approach that all of them had a part in designing is going to benefit the city tremendously. You mentioned the budget earlier, and we asked a spokesperson for the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing about whether the province is ready to support London with this plan. Mm -hmm. uh, they sent us a statement via email on Friday, March 24th. Here's what they had to say. Okay. In 2022, the province launched the New Homelessness Prevention Program, HPP, and the City of London has been allocated $13,375,000, an increase of more than $850,000 from 2021 to 2022. In total, the City of London has been allocated approximately $23.5 million for housing and homelessness funding in 2022 to 2023. In addition, as we just announced in Budget 2023, the Ontario government is investing an additional $202 million dollars annually in the homelessness prevention program bringing Ontario's total yearly investment to close to 700 million dollars that's a lot of numbers yeah, it is. <laughs> um, what's your response to that uh, well my response to that is let me start with the last thing you said and that's the new needed investments that we've been advocating for um, I've had conversations with Premier Ford uh, Health Minister Jones uh, Minister Tobolo um, Minister Clark uh, about the need for investments in mental health and addictions and homelessness prevention mm -hmm. and they have delivered on that in the budget yes there have been investments before but what we knew and what we've seen through COVID is the situation get worse mm -hmm. the demands on our system increase the number of people on our streets go up uh, we know that COVID has 
uh, illuminated great inequity uh, in people's capacity to, to help themselves and be in a stably housed environment. We also have gone through an unprecedented time of cost and uh, a co of cost increases, whether that's housing affordability or just simply the cost of living of groceries, gas, fuel, all the things that the people all the uh, things people that you and I with mm -hmm. you know kids know that uh, things get more expensive. So um, the need has never been greater, mm -hmm. which means the investment needs to be never greater. And so is what, the, uh, is what the province offering enough? I think it's an enormous start, right? And that what the province has put in our hands, and I'll have to wait to see the exact numbers as they flow down to our city, because mm -hmm. you know you're, you, you talk about province-wide numbers of 200 million and 400 million in different envelopes. What we have in our city, uh, we're pretty confident that this gets us started. The money that they put in, in front of us allows us to open hubs, allows us to move people into those spaces, allows us to start building the housing that will support those hubs in partnership with others like the federal government. So um, is it enough in the long run? I, I, I can't tell you. Will there be ongoing needed supports? Probably. So, But this starts a really important conversation of partnership with the province. They have listened. They have put more money into the space. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to let them know whether that's enough, whether it's focused right, and where we need to go next. Because we're in this together, in my opinion. Um, this received uh, unanimous support from your city council. How has it been received from the people of London? Well, I, I, you talked about my state of city, the state of the city off the address. And one of the different things I did with my state of the city is it wasn't a state of the city uh, on job creation or economics uh, or, or businesses coming to our city. It was about health and homelessness. This is something that I have focused on, that my council is 100% behind, and that everyone in the community and every sector knows it is a significant challenge we need to tackle. So the reception mm -hmm. to our work has been one with optimism and hope. Um, this Why is, is it important to you? I, we've got like 30 yeah. seconds. Why is this important to you? It, it's important because these are our people on our streets. This is a need that, that if we don't provide it, if we don't bring people together, who else will? Um, they're, they're, they're residents, they're citizens, they're people who are friends and families, they're moms, they're brothers and sisters. And they are suffering and they are dying. And we need to take action. So it's important to me because it's people's lives at stake. Your Worship, thank you so much for coming in all the way from London to our studio. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Yeah, my pleasure to be here. Huge ships still ferry billions in goods across the Great Lakes every year. But when they've done their final run, many find their way to a place in Port Colborne, Ontario. I went there to see how the dangerous work of shipbreaking happens and why the global industry could learn something from them. Have a look. This is where ships in the Great Lakes come to die. From freighters like the one behind me to ferries, this yard has been the final resting place for over 100 vessels. The Ojibwe, measuring more than 600 feet long and 67 feet wide, spent nearly 70 years navigating the lakes. Soon to be on the chopping block, the ST Crapo, a nearly century-old self-loading cement carrier arriving from the shores of Green Bay, Wisconsin and the Manistee, a self-unloading bulk carrier with nearly eight decades of nautical mileage arriving by tow in 2022 from Ohio. Their final destination, Marine Recycling Corporation. 27 acres of land riddled with pieces of Great Lakes history. This is the main yard for Ontario's only year-round shipbreaking company. Situated at Port Colborne, Ontario, Marine Recycling Corporation sits near the mouth of the Welland Canal, a busy stretch of waterway that connects ships to Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. There's the Ojibwe wheelhouse we're driving by, and in the spring it'll go on a barge. It's going to be a cottage, I guess, for someone. Wayne Elliott is a shipbreaker, and he's been doing it for more than half a century. So we recycle old ships of all types, warships, freighters, tugs, barges submarines. Uh, we've recycled actually pretty much everything except an aircraft carrier. Amongst the names of the famous vessels he's recycled, a few stand out. Henry Ford the, the second. Uh, that was a very popular ship with the museums and people. The Henry Steinbrenner it was named after uh, the former Yankees owner George Steinbrenner, named after his father. 
there are two ways vessels can arrive at their shipyard from the Great Lakes. Most, like the ST Crapo, are towed by tugboats, while others are steamed in on their own power. Using a combination of torches, cranes, and shears, it could take several months for a freighter like the Ojibwe to end up looking like this. The process generally starts with cutting torches, parts of the ship that are too high for the shears to reach to start with, and uh, lifting out heavy machinery and engines that are not sheared. There are many dangers, it's a dangerous business. We're lifting uh, sections of ships up to 100 tons, and on top of it, they're not new ships, so we have to be very careful that lifts won't tear. Yeah, it, it just has to be safety first. Marine Recycling Corporation collects portholes, lights, and other scraps from the ships, but the main haul is steel. The steel is chewed up into tiny pieces and then loaded onto dump trucks where they're shipped to local steel mills in southern Ontario. Many of the ships Wayne and his team recycle have been on the open waters for decades. For the most part, this yard recycles ships that have spent the majority of their time navigating the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway, better known as Lakers. Lakers can remain in service much longer than their ocean counterparts, also known as salties. The corrosive seawater can do serious damage to a steel ship, which in turn creates a shorter lifespan. But with decades of service comes decades worth of buildup. When a ship arrives under its own power, it has fuel, uh, lubricating oils, uh, waste oils, it has all of that aboard, so that's the first order of business. In North America, the environment wasn't always as protected as it is now. Wayne has seen the changes firsthand in the three generations his family has been in the industry. My dad worked for another family in Hamilton and started a ship breaking yard in 1959. I remember as a kid, uh, Believe it or not, they used to burn the ships out to get rid of the furnishings. And uh, even back to uh, the 60s, you know, there was no Environmental Protection Act till 1970. There was no rules. So I can remember my dad in Hamilton, the fire chief and the deputy chief were, were friends as well. And he would call the, the chief or the deputy and say, okay, the wind is headed towards the Skyway Bridge. Okay, to light this up and they would burn out the, the accommodation section of ships. They used to burn copper in those days, and I always remembered the horrible taste in my throat. Wayne estimates that 95% of the shipbreaking industry contributes to pollution. And it's not just dirty work, it also comes with its risks. Globally, shipbreaking has been described as the world's most dangerous job. In parts of South Asia, the leaders in shipbreaking, that title holds true. According to NGO Shipbreaking Platform, a global collective that monitors environmental harm and human rights abuses, more than 7,000 ships have been scrapped in South Asia since 2009, causing at least 441 deaths and 384 injuries. They don't go after the waste first. In places like Turkey, Bangladesh, India, they use the beaching method where the back end or the stern of the ship, which which has many of the pollutants, the, the machinery spaces, the oil, uh, they're the last thing to be recycled. Even with three other shipyards on Canada's coastlines, Elliot says his biggest competitors are still on the other side of the ocean. We're really against towing these lake vessels across the Atlantic Ocean. At one point, uh, it was about one out of every 20 wouldn't make it. You know, you can imagine the, you know, the potential uh, for an accident. It's very difficult to compete when you're the opposite of that. And, uh, but, you know, so far so good. At one point, Elliot estimates there were half a dozen shipbreakers on the Great Lakes. But for the last 20 years, they've been the only full-time shipbreaking company in Canada. And uh, it's a difficult business. On top of everything, it's a gamble. Uh, I remember one year we brought a ship in in late January and February 1st, the, the price of steel scrap dropped $85 a ton. So we were out a million dollars before we touched the ship. That's the worst part. Despite the challenges that come with ship breaking, Wayne doesn't see himself stopping anytime soon. We're the most experienced ship breakers in the world, so I'm kind of proud of that. It's a family tradition. It's what we do. We're, uh, we're the best at it. Uh, we, I love the ships. I mean, I always did.
The agenda this week debated the need to open the green belt to build housing, assessed a new deal to build a road to the ring of fire, and analyzed the crisis facing Pakistan. The agenda's week in review begins recapping our coverage of Ontario's 2023 budget. I probably should not ask you this next question since it's a bit of a personal pet peeve of mine, and that is the amount of electricity subsidization that the taxpayers of this province are doing. And I note in the budget this year, it totals $6.5 billion, which is the highest ever. Uh, Treasurer, you and I earn six-figure incomes, and I don't know about you, but when I look at my monthly statement from Toronto Hydro, it actually gives me a $10 deduction on my hydro bill because the taxpayers of Ontario, or I guess you as the government, in your wisdom, believe in this subsidization of my power usage. Um, I can tell you right now, I don't need it. I got a feeling you don't need it. And I got a bigger feeling that that money, for all the people who make six-figure incomes and who live in nice homes, they don't need it either. Why don't you get rid of that and put that money to something more useful? Well, I'll tell you what, Steve, uh, that's a pet peeve of mine, and I'll, I'll explain that. You know, we have the situation because the previous government overpaid for uh, power that we didn't need by, by some $33 billion. So I have a pet peeve as well. But I'll also say this, you know, and I said this uh, the other day on your podcast, you know, now that we've tabled the 2023 budget, we start working on the 2024 budget, and I listen to all Ontarians, and that includes Steve Pakin. So I'll <laughs> consider this the first budget consultation on TVO today. I'm not sure if we should regard it that way, because that might put me in a bit of difficulty. But, um, you know, I do wonder whether or not you think it is a sensible thing to subsidize power usage by, by people who make a decent income rather than, say, repurposing that money to a better idea. Do you think this is something you really want to tackle going forward? You've been in power four and a half years, so I'm not sure blaming the previous government still holds water at this point. Well, the legacy costs are still there, Steve, so I, I'm going to call them to account as we navigate through this. But, but look, that's one aspect. Uh, you're, you're raising the means testing uh, opportunity on that. Uh, we're looking at the whole energy. Uh, we constantly are looking at uh, the whole energy sector. And, and you know, we have, a, we have another challenge that we've got to, uh, to face is that because of our growing economy, because we're building so much infrastructure, guess what we need to power that? energy and electricity. So our needs are, are going to be significant. And so that's why, you know, we're investing in, in, in the electricity uh, solutions for tomorrow. You said you've never seen a party so gleefully celebrate mediocrity than this one today uh, on this budget. How come? Absolutely. I mean, I can't imagine being a, a government that actually has the revenue and has the resources to address the cost of living, the cost pressures that Ontarians are facing. So this budget missed the moment. And the fact that this government missed the moment means that they just haven't been paying attention. Uh, one of the number one pressures that we are all hearing as MPPs across the province is housing. And Bill 23 is a piece of legislation that's on the books which removes development charges from municipalities which will prohibit them from actually achieving the housing stock that's needed for the province of Ontario. Uh, and listen, for, for a budget like this to not even mention the word autism, is really an, a, an abdication of, of leadership, really, when you see what's happening in the province of Ontario right now. So this, this is a government that, you know, is very quick to pat themselves on the back. Uh, they, they shout out their own accolades at question period. We've all seen it. It's beyond annoying. And, and this is fundamentally an irresponsible budget when you're looking at uh, the health care pressures, the education pressure, pressures, and even the mental health pressures. Stephanie Bowman, what are you calling this budget? Uh, Steve, you know, I'm calling this uh, an underwhelming budget. It's, uh, it's a status quo budget that continues to, um, you know, drive forward on the favorite projects of the government, you know, building highways, talking about building homes, because again, they're not getting all that done, mm -hmm. um, and underservicing the people of Ontario who need, need help around health care, education, opioid, you know, facing opioid crisis and dealing with mental health addictions. And we have a climate crisis, which again, is, is just not being touched at all here in this budget. Mm -hmm. Mike Schreiner, you've called this a head-in-the-sand budget. Why did you use that expression? 
Because the budget ignores some of the biggest crisis we're facing in Ontario, namely the housing affordability crisis. As a matter of fact, their plans are actually going to make it worse, not better. Mm -hmm. The health human resource crisis that we're facing that's negatively affecting our health care system. Just the fact that uh, so many people are facing poverty. People on, on Ontario Disability Support and Ontario Works are living with crushing poverty, the way the cost of living is affecting folks. And then finally, just the inability to address the climate crisis and namely the effects that's going to have the risk associated people's homes and businesses and the way it's going to negatively affect people's and municipalities' budgets. Let me give you one quick example. According to the Financial Accountability Officer, Climate change's effect to public infrastructure is going to cost an additional $26.2 billion over the next seven years alone, yeah. just this decade. Nothing in this budget, nothing in this budget to help municipalities deal with the high cost of those infrastructure threats that are actually going to be made worse by this government sprawl agenda. All right, let's uh, dive a little deeper on a second round of questioning here. And I do want to talk about the deficit for a second because they are, Catherine, crowing about the fact that they are going to balance the books three years faster than anticipated and of course are taking a certain amount of credit for their financial stewardship in doing so. Are they entitled to do that? No. I mean, and also this government uses the deficit, which is a moving target, and I'm, I'm glad that you're going to be talking to the FAA later on because he's been tracking this. They use the deficit as an excuse not to invest. Uh, and they've, they, today in the House when they said, we will balance the budget, all I could think of is that they're going to be balancing the budget on the backs of the most vulnerable people in this province. And that actually has greater costs. It has greater costs to the health care system, to the justice system, to the mental health system, and obviously to the education system you talked about 7500 new hospital beds 4500 of which would have to be built new 2500 repurposed they had 3000 funding for 3000 in there not 4500 3000 do they get an f from you because of that well, it's not up to me, right? So that's the fun part about this job. All we do is we point out and say, okay, if we look at the population of 65-year-olds, because those are the ones who occupy more than half of the hospital beds. That's just the way it is. And that population is growing over time. They're going to need more hospital beds out there to accommodate that population. If we're looking at five years, that's where we come up with our 4,500 number, 7,500 actually in total. Mm. The government had a plan in place to put 7,000 new beds in the 3,000 they promised, probably another 1,000 that they want to repurpose, mm -hmm. and then 2,500 they want to free up by moving people to alternate levels of care. And we've said, at that time, remember, our report was a snapshot in time, and this budget is a new snapshot in a new time uh, where we've seen more money put into these, to these programs to fund the policies that they've articulated. But it, it, he didn't hit the numbers that you said needed to be hit. What do we infer from that? That they're, they're, it, So two things. Either there's more work to do if they want to deliver the service in the same way, if they want mm -hmm. to provide enough hospital beds for the 65 and over population and for the whole population of Ontario on the same basis that we've done in 20, 2019, which wasn't great, by the way. We still have lots of hallway health care. Mm -hmm. However, if that's, the, if that's what they're trying to achieve, they're going to need to do a little bit more. If they have a different way of delivering health care or they're trying some new things where they don't need to add those hospital beds, then, you know, terrific. Let's see, let's see what it looks like. Let's do more examples. You said that they are here funding long-term care beds and they need to be here. Now you've seen what they've put in the budget today. How much closer to the number they need to be at are they? So on a gross basis overall, it looks like they've, as I said, they've done a pretty good job of right sizing. We won't actually know the detail of sector by sector until we go and do our own analysis and publish our report in uh, in the spring, in, in May. But I think to reiterate on that 30,000 bed commitment, so that would basically try to maintain the same wait list, the same number of beds uh, per population as we saw in 2019. It won't reduce wait times. In fact, it won't quite get to the 2019 level. <laughs> so if that's what they're trying to do, and they've added new funding, and we'll figure that out by the time we get a report out, then kudos. Mr. Director, can we please see the green belt? There it is. Look how far it goes east. For those who are listening on podcast, you can't see. There's a big green swath of land that goes all around the west end of Lake Ontario on the north side of the lake from the Oak Ridges Moraine all the way around the south side of the lake to Niagara River, 325 kilometers worth of protected land. Now let's hit the main question off the top. Do we have enough land already available to accommodate future growth 
or do we need to open up, as the province suggests, parts of that green belt in order to accommodate more development? Jane, get us started. Well, thank you. Absolutely, we have enough land already in the pipeline. We've got probably more land than Ontario has ever had that's been designated for future development. And now we have uh, the, the Kevin Eby report that's looked at uh, the official plan updates and all the land that was uh, designated there, but not just designated, all the land that we had before the new designation would be adequate uh, for supplying two million new homes. Two million. Two and, million. And the target's a million and a half. That's right. So you think we got more than enough? Absolutely, we have way more than enough. Chris, what say you? Yeah, I think um, we could accommodate population growth in Toronto if we were uh, prepared to upzone Toronto sufficiently. So Paris has, I think, five times more uh, a more dense population than Toronto does. Paris, France. Paris, France. So if you kind of applied that to Toronto, we could fit, you know, maybe 10 more million people um, in Toronto itself. I think the problem is that we have these land use rules within the city and within all cities that constrain new housing supply. So when you think about this calculation, I think of it as we could build tall within cities, and I think that's preferred, and I'd love to do more of that. We could build sprawl, maybe even including into the uh, into the green belt, or we could build a wall, and we could stop immigration. And, and the way I think about it is, is that order in which I said that, that's my preference. I think we should build tall to the extent that we can, but I'd rather build sprawl than nothing at all, or, or, or have to build a wall and kind of reduce immigration or something like that. But it's your view that we're not building tall enough in Toronto, and therefore... If that's the case, then we may have to look at other options. Correct. I, I mean, there's this term in Toronto. We have the green belt. In Toronto, we have the yellow belt, right? The neighborhoods land use uh, designation in the official plan where you can't really intensify, at least not yet. Um, and I think that if you want to be pro green belt, which I generally am, you have to be anti yellow belt and you have to kind of like pair um, the, the need for, for there being less sprawl with a need for there being more infill development and, and taller buildings within cities. Okay. Rob, what say you? Yeah. So, um, my full disclosure as well, I represent the Regional Planning Commissioners of Ontario at this table as well, uh, which is uh, basically the planning chiefs for the single tier cities and regions, and they represent about 80% of the population. Um, the short answer is no. Uh, we don't RP need to open the RPCO, green belt. and personally, I don't think there's any need to open the green belt as a way to address the housing needs. I know we'll get into talking about it, but even if we just start with the numbers, 50,000 housing units is about 3.3% of the $1.5 million target. And I think as we get into the discussion, we can talk about where might we otherwise find those 50,000, let alone, let's talk about how important this $2 million or 2 million acre assembly of land is to Ontarians. Hmm. How are you so sure that we don't need to open up the green belt? Because the province is quite adamant that we do need to do that. Yeah, and, and there's been lots of discussion about uh, inventory and capacity, and the Regional Planning Commissioners actually uh, undertook the exercise of, of determining how much housing is unbuilt mm -hmm. and in the pipe, and that means a building permit is available today or formal applications are in the process. Our number was 1.25 million housing units, which represents 85% of the province's 1.5 million unit goal. That's in the pipeline already? In the pipeline or approved. So this is year two of the 10-year program. Okay. And, and we sit at 85%. I get you, but you know the expression, just because uh, it's happening in the paper, just because it's happening on paper doesn't mean it's happening on the ground. Absolutely. And our PCO's contention, my PCO's is, is what? The Regional Planning Commission's okay. contention, mine as well is, we need to stop focusing on numbers. We need to start focusing on getting shovels in the ground. All right, that takes me back to Jane. You know that the province has suggested that some municipalities are not fast enough with their approvals. They're gumming up the works. There are too many regulations. There are too many development charges and so on. And that's slowing things down inordinately so. What do you say to that? Well, I think that we can do better, for sure. But... You have to also realize that uh, developers have this pipeline, as Rob was saying, and they have building permits and they're not building. Like, Wh why with, not? Well, like a business that it needs that pipeline to keep steady business going. You know, you've only got so many workers and so much product. You want to have it all lined up, and that's the pipeline. So they've got they're building a, a lot of houses now. Then they've they've got the permits. That'll be the next houses. Beyond that, we've got the land that's it's got um, planning done on it, but they haven't pulled any permits yet, but they will get to it. And on down to land that's designated residential that we haven't planned yet. 
So it's this huge pipeline is moving along. Um, so, but we can't make the builders build faster than they want to. Well, let me take that to Chris. You know, uh, we do have a bit of a labor shortage here. We do have higher interest rates now than we did a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Are those things and other things combining to slow down what's going through the pipeline? Yeah, I think so. And, and uh, very timely, there was a piece published at TVO.org by Steve LaFleur and Joseph uh, Filipowicz on this question, like how many of these units that are in this pipeline is being deemed an application was been made, but they're not yet under construction. So where exactly do they sit? And what often happens is the slower the municipal entitlement process is, the longer it takes, the higher you are, uh, the higher the risk is that by the time you're at the end of it, your pro forma no longer works. The Hudson Bay lowlands um, are vast, from Churchill, Manitoba, to a little section uh, around uh, Quebec's uh, James Bay. And it's almost as large as the country of Norway. Hmm. So when you're talking about one third of a square kilometer, that quite literally is like a less than a pinprick on the backside of an elephant. So the impact is absolutely minimum and uh, you're digging up the material that we desperately need to uh, decarbonize um, um, the transportation sector. I'm going to follow up on that in a second, but I just want to get Virginia on this. Uh, we, there's copper, there's gold, there's chromium, there's nickel. Are you making the argument that the nickel is what should be gone after first, and if so, why? Well, that just makes sense. I mean, it's it's the most uh, drilled off deposit. Um, so there's been exploration going on there since 2007. Uh, uh, so it's 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 a, it's an established deposit. The other ones would be at an, an earlier stage of exploration. And also because it's a high-grade nickel deposit. That's what I want. So is, it's, yeah, it's high-quality nickel. Yeah, this is a high-grade nickel deposit, and and this is what we need. Um, Doug Ford's grand plan to have EV battery manufacturing in Ontario uh, requires that we have critical minerals, especially nickel. There is an argument to be made that if we're going to fulfill our potential as it relates to getting electric vehicles on the road, we need the minerals that are going to be required to make that happen, and the minerals for that are there. So that, are you making the argument that every day we delay getting that stuff out of the ground is a day that we are delaying having our highways be more pollution free? Uh, that absolutely can be said. I mean, just today, the uh, International um, Climate Change Committee has come out with a report that they want to fast forward 2050 to 2040. Uh, because we are in a climate change emergency. So the longer we delay on building the road and starting construction of the mines, uh, the more problematic it gets. Uh, and, and remember, um, we're seeing this entire transition f uh, of the uh, uh, um, internal combustion engine to the electric vehicle engine market. Um, and we, right now, uh, and, and just some context uh, before it, um, uh, before COVID, we, the world produced roughly 100 million cars, give or take. Now think about it. 100 million cars has to, have to be converted to electric vehicles, uh, and, and that's the plan. And right now, we don't have enough nickel to do that. We don't even have enough nickel to, to do half of that or even a quarter of that. So the sooner we get more uh, nickel coming on stream, especially from jurisdictions uh, world-class jurisdictions like Ontario that have rules and regulations, uh, the better it is for climate change emergency. Well, this is what I want to put to Kristen, because you, obviously there are going to be people watching us and listening to us right now who are going to say, <laughs> you know, how can mining, which which can be done, which can be done, let me put it this way, which certainly is done today better than it was done 50 years ago in terms of the impact it has on, on the climate and the environment and so on, how can, how can mining be a good thing to do even if the idea is to get to more EVs on the road at the end of the day. Can you t speak to that? It's a, it's a great question, Steve. I can start with not all nickels created equally, and not all nickel comes from the same types of deposits. For the Eagle's Nest deposit, which I, I might add starts at surface and goes down to 1.2 kilometers down to depth and, and, and the bottom is not known yet, but it is a, a sulfide-hosted deposit. What does that mean? That means that the nickel and the copper are tied up with sulfur minerals, uh, sulfur minerals in, in terms of minerals. And as we extract the rock, then we want to concentrate those sulfur minerals to be able to process the nickel that comes, uh, process the material that comes out of it to extract the nickel and copper. That's not new. 
The other type of deposits are nickel deposits that are hosted in, in silicates or laterites or uh, oxide type deposits. Mm -hmm. Those deposits, while they have a, a tremendous amount of nickel, are typically hosted around the circumequatorial region. So think of Indonesia, think of places like New Caledonia that both Inku and Falkenbridge 20 years ago invested in plants in. This is halfway around the world. Exactly, halfway around the world. But they are very energy intensive processes to extract the nickel out of it. For instance, in Indonesia, it's about six times the energy to extract a unit of nickel out of a uh, nickel pig iron plant um, to be able to create class one nickel that would then go into a battery that would be used for a battery electric vehicle. And again, remember the context of this is around creating environmentally sustainably sourced nickel in through here. But this is the point I want to, uh, I, I'd like you to speak to, which is are the gains we will make through electric vehicles on the roads, therefore polluting less, worth the damage, let's call it damage, the damage that will be done by mining in that area? Well, they certainly can be in North America, and particularly in Ontario, where better than 90% of our electricity is non-carbon sourced into here. Quebec is, is, is uniquely positioned as well, because the majority of their hydro comes from hydro comes from hydroelectricity. James Bay. Exactly, in that. So we're uniquely positioned with the Eagle's Nest deposit to participate in that market if we have a favorable environment to be able to construct and permit new mines. Yeah. heard about the yeah. terrible floods yeah. that took so many lives over there. How has that contributed to the economic instability? It has contributed massively. The economic uh, uh, cost of flooding, as estimated by the World Bank study, is about $15 billion, which is twice the amount that Pakistan owes to International Monetary Fund. Uh, the human uh, cost of this flooding have been massive. They have affected about 33 million people, which is close to the total population in Canada. It has destroyed about 60 to 80 percent uh, of the crops in Pakistan, leading to a lot of uh, food inflation. Uh, the livelihoods of people associated with agriculture have been um, affected a lot as well. Yeah. Is this a country that is impossible to govern, given its current conditions? Uh, it is, I wouldn't say it is impossible to govern, but it is difficult to govern. Uh, and uh, I think the country has to, and as well as its economic and political managers, have to make like tough choices right now to put the country back to the path uh, of economic growth. Okay, well, I'm going to go to Mariam on that as well. Because, like, Canada is difficult to govern. Um, is Pakistan impossible to govern? Because surely it's got to be harder to govern Pakistan right now than it is Canada. I wouldn't say impossible, but I will say that it is one of the toughest countries in the world to govern uh, and uh, extremely complicated. And to me, this is completely unsurprising. To govern 243 million people who are ethnically and linguistically diverse, um, and not to mention Pakistan's geopolitical context, where um, the country, on the one hand, is trying to maintain parity with its much larger neighbor, India, um, and also being extremely important to the United States' national security interests means that uh, Pakistan Pakistan has become incredibly aid dependent. Uh, that has prevented Pakistan's uh, political leaders from uh, establishing sustainable economic institutions that, to a certain extent, speak to what Saadia is talking about, the current economic crisis um, in the country. And the last thing I would definitely say, add to this the challenges of development, add to this a burgeoning population of young people with aspirations, um, and, uh, and then a, a political elite and a military establishment that is not necessarily willing to allow democracy to flourish in the country. Yes, it is a very, very difficult country to govern, and it's facing challenges uh, in, in many different sectors. It's national security, um, threats to uh, its um, security from uh, terrorists, and then, of course, you know, internal domestic problems, as we've been talking about. Well, to the end of trying to be a good democratic country, Umber, I'll ask you to pick up the story there, because uh, a thriving journalistic sector is necessary to make that happen, and that's where you come in. And yet, we find out from Reporters Without Borders, the World Press Freedom Index, which assesses the state of journalism in 180 countries and territories around the world, and out of 180, Pakistan ranks 157, which doesn't sound too good. So I wonder how, how concerned are you about your safety, and how hard is it for you to do your job? Uh, thank you. Um, I think I, I, I'm, I'm concerned about my safety because I've, I've seen friends and colleagues 
who have been attacked, uh, who have been picked up, who have been killed. Um, one journalist who was murdered uh, last year, I worked with him for, for a few years um, at one channel, Arshad Sharif. Um, uh, he was killed in another country, in Kenya. Um, Do we know by whom? Investigation. No, we don't know by uh, we don't know yet. There has been there have been fact finding missions uh, from uh, state representatives uh, as well as independent media organizations. Uh, there have been whispers and rumors. There was a case that was opened up. We don't know. Um, similarly, there are other colleagues and friends of mine who were you know whose houses were who were a uh, house was broken into. Uh, he was a former producer of mine actually, uh, and he was attacked. Another former colleague of mine was picked up for a day. We made a lot of fuss on social media. Um, I lost my job as a result of many of the attacks and and I was I lost my job doing Imran Khan's time uh, what I'm trying to say is that if it really does feel as if um, the tactics haven't changed the current government used to criticize Imran Khan and rightfully so on his democratic credentials as well as freedom of press because we saw a great slide in Pakistan's uh, press freedom index during Imran Khan's time but none of this has been corrected which points to the same problem um, if, if the problem isn't the civilian government, the problem has to be the military elite or the military establishment, uh, which is, you know, which perhaps is continuing those same tactics. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, March 24th, 2023. Monday, political scientist Joseph Wong will be here on his new book about why development and democracy haven't advanced equally in the transformations of Asian countries over the past century. And just a note before we go, Sunday at 7 p.m. on TVO, we've got a new edition of The Thread. This time, we're looking at doctor shortages in the province and how that leads to trouble for people and the healthcare system more broadly. You can catch it on air or on any of our streaming and social platforms. Hope you can join us for that. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. Have a great weekend and Steve will see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.